Hi, hello humans. This is Daniel. Uh, so as I said, I work for Red Hat. I work in the real-time team. We have our Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux for real-time product. And most of my time I spent doing research and development on the real-time kernel. I also work in the uh, helping maintaining parts of the kernel, mainly related to the RTLA, parts of tracing where we do this tracing analysis that we'll see today, and rescheduling mainly. Uh, in the deadline scheduling. So this presentation is about uh, the main metric we have on the on the real time in Linux, right? <clears throat> the people that look more when they, they search for real time Linux, and we will discuss it today. <clears throat> because you know, even though Linux was not designed to be a real time operating system at the beginning, <clears throat> over the last two decades, it evolved to be uh, uh, a real time operating system. Uh, <clears throat> there are very levels of real time that people can, can argue and say what is or what is not a real time operating system. And we can stay here for days, if not years, uh, discussing whether Linux is a real time operating system or not. But there are many use cases where Linux is indeed used as a real-time operating system. So uh, <clears throat> it's a fact, right? And there are many reasons for people to use Linux as a real-time operating system, or also, or, or maybe better, for people to move from embedded operating system to, li to Linux as a RTOS, right? One of the main reasons is the main power. There are many people that understand real that understand Linux and that can can work on tuning Linux and making things work. Uh, but one of the main drivers for this is that this new cool uh, stack of software that is driving the future. They were built. They were developed. They were thought to be to to run on Linux mainly with the cloud and the edge and the things get mixed, right? Linux is the native platform for many of these applications, uh, many of those that, that will interact with the real world, right? With uh, self-driven cars and, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. So embedded systems. So <clears throat> there is not only our, okay, I'm a, a Linux developer. I wanted to make Linux a real-time system because I think it's cool. It, it's not that anymore. It's the real demand from companies that would like to use the AI stack on the edge for the self-driven cars. So th th this thing is, is way more than a, 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 a hi, I want it. It's a, we need it, right? So because we need it, more people are, are landing on Linux to say, okay, I, I need to use Linux as a real-time operating system. And uh, and this is also possible because this, okay, this need is fitted by the fact that Linux can achieve very good timing behavior nowadays. Not only for, for the latency, that is the topic that we will discuss today, but also because of, of scheduling, right? We have like advanced real-time scheduling features on Linux that will improve over, over time, but, uh, they are still there. We have deadline scheduling with EDF. We have the fully preemptive kernel that can give us very short latencies and uh, and so on. So we have this this win-win situation where Linux provide good numbers already, and we have this demand coming and people, oh, we need a real-time Linux because it will unlock this new, new set of uh, embedded uh, uh, software. I'm missing a word that was a very hot topic on the on research in, in the last years. Uh, it's not coming. Cyber physical system, cyber physical system. So these people with cyber physical systems that would like to run this new stack with Linux, they they need it. So uh, one one of the problems, however, is that because Linux evolved to become operating system in a very developer way and not, like say, like an academic way. Uh, over the years, uh, the way that Linux was tried to show its timing behavior, it was not rooted on a sort of analysis or on the composition of variables like people in the academia like, right? They were mostly using uh, using test case, using black box tools that would mimic the behavior of the, of a, a real time application, and then they would complain if things doesn't show like the desired result in time. 
So for example, uh, for testing the scheduling latency on Linux, the most famous tool is cyclic test. And uh, and the cyclic test, I will show somehow some data, I think it's next slide, yeah, how it works. And so these tools, they generally, they reply a, a latency number, right? They reply a latency number. They say, okay, this is the latency that my system can, can achieve. But uh, uh, but it it doesn't show you why and how bad can it be in, in the sense of uh, trying to compose things from here and there. Right? So this is a limitation. And don't get me wrong, I, I have code on cyclic tests and I work with people doing cyclic tests. This is not like a fight. This is the evolution of the tooling that we use every day. So getting, getting, getting really basic. Uh, how do we measure scheduling latency in this black box approach on Linux nowadays? So uh, there is a, a thread, a Percipio thread generally, and this thread, it sets a timer for the future, right? Using an external clock reference, the wall clock, or right? So it says, okay, wake me up at uh, 2 p.m. It's a shorter granularity, it's in the microseconds, but let's say 2 p.m. And then the timer fires in the hardware. And this timer, what it does, it wakes up a thread. And then this thread starts to executing. And the first thing that this thread does, it's looking at the clock. And so it looks at the clock and says, hmm, it's 2 p.m. or plus uh, 4, 40 microseconds. So my latency is 40 microseconds because I was expecting at 2 p.m. So this is it's not only in a nutshell this is it that's how it works <clears throat> so okay the black box approach one can say oh it doesn't work no it actually works because linux evolved in this way so but it has some drawbacks that makes for life uh harder right because it doesn't give us a, a root cause analysis saying okay this this latency was bad because of this so you have an evidence or, or, or where to look at to debug the system or to tune the system or to or, or in the case like internal Red Hat workflows, like on trying to say that this report from this user is the same report of these users. So we can concentrate into a, a single problem instead of two. So this root cause analysis, it's generally done like with this previous approach, it was generally done using tracing. Uh, so it would uh, a guy that understands tracing would go into the Linux kernel and say, "Oh, I would like to enable this kernel event and this kernel event, and then uh, wait for the thread to stop, and then go back and try to so this event from this event to this event it took that amount uh, taken out, but that work and trying to speculate, right? So this thing is, let's like say, independent. This this independent thing traces they are good by a human. That is, a human is looking at the trace and try to interpret it." And I did this for more than 10 years. And I've been working at Red Hat for 10 years and I've been doing this way before Red Hat. So after 10 years doing this glue of tracing and trying to connect things, uh, I mean, I just start getting annoyed. And then it doesn't scale because it's there are not many people that are there ready to get into all the details, even if it's a repeated bug, right? There's no not enough people for trying to understand all the repeated bugs. It's better to concentrate people to at least on a view of what is a bug. And that's where one of the motivations for the auto analysis that uh, we'll see later. But uh, who cares, right? Who cares? Uh, other than the poor duty doing the debug, like the Daniel trying to solve the the the, the, the case. Uh, the, the, main, the main point is, as I said before, there is this, this large demand for running Linux as a real-time operating system. And uh, there will be more people in need of understanding this. Uh, and uh, there is there's these people that would like to run it real time. And there is another set of people that doesn't care about real time that much. Let's say I'm a kernel developer that works with a file system, right? And I send a new, a new patch to the kernel and it starts breaking the latency. That will be more of a problem uh, when we finally get the parameter to merge it, because regressions on, on other subsystem people in the real time will say, okay, this patch created me a regression. How can you show to this to this person doing a, 
uh, file system that it's breaking? And how can you give a test case that shows, okay, to you here, it's your problem. You see, it's your problem. It's in your uh, stack trace. Uh, and now it's not anymore, right? Giving them the tools for them to make their life easier while debugging their thing that has nothing to do with RT. They just don't want to break someone else's uh, properties or someone else's metrics. And that take, that happens very often in the kernel development. And we do take even more when the print RT gets, gets merged. And, uh, and, and there is this use case that I mentioned before, like automotive is coming, is coming strong trying to use the Linux. Uh, and they also need more than, than just numbers. They would like to, to, to have more knowledge of the system, to show more documentation, to explain things better. There's also factory automation and, and the, link, the, the things grow up. Like the, the synergy on, on Linux for cyber physical systems is, is bringing us these, these more and more needs. So, and, and here this, this is the, 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 the thing that motivated the timer lot. There are even more things that are research. I think I pasted the, uh, a link that things that came before it, but this is the, the, the story that brings us to the timer lot. So the timer lot is a tool that aims to address this, like giving evidence of where the latency is. And it, it is not only a tool, it's a composition of internal tracing and user space tooling, right? So. The, the in kernel tracer, so the timer lot is a tracer inside F trace, and it's it shares a lot of the code with the OS noise tracer. And the main idea here is that trying to do in kernel and processing in kernel for those things that is faster to do in kernel than doing user space, but that doesn't create uh, overheads to change the picture. So we try to do things that are, are the small amount of things in the kernel. And, and these are the tracers. We have the timer lot tracer and the OS noise tracer. So it starts by this. It's not only a tool, it's a, it starts from a tracer. This tracer can also dispatch a workload that mimics that, uh, that, that, that behavior that we see before, right? A per CPU thread dispatch it, and it sets a timer in the future and so on. We'll get more into these later. Uh, so we have these components in the kernel. This thing is very well documented. And you see this paper here. It's a paper, Operating System Noise in the Linux Kernel, that explains the OS noise uh, tracer. But most of it fits also for the timer lot tracer. It's a, a nice source of information for another metric that's also important. And you can see here it's uh, nitro transactions on computers and it's a uh, open access granted by the university that I work here in Italy that I collaborate. So this is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is a tool named RTLA, real-time Linux analysis, right? <clears throat> so the RTLA is a is a suite of tools, and inside of it there is a tool that is timer lot. So the timer lot is a, is a benchmark benchmark like interface. The benchmark interface is for the tracer. You can use timer timer lot is purely as a tracer, like with uh, from tracefs or using trace command. But the RTLA timer lot gives us, a, a, let's say, a, a more shine uh, interface for it. It's easier to use. Uh, the idea is that it sets up, collects, and parses the trace data and gives us some outputs, like quantifying the latency a top-like interface and a histogram interface that I will show later with videos, right? So we have inside the RTLA, we have timer.top, that is a tool, and timer.hist, that is another tool. <clears throat> uh, and we have an auto-analysis, that is a thing that uh, will do what Daniel, <laughs> Daniel or, or the guy on the terminal would do analyzing the tracer, the trace, and giving an, an, a starting point for the, a starting point for the analysis. And it also has a, a timer lot, a user, uh, there's a kernel space workload and a user space workload if people uh, will, will, if people would like to have the traces. So uh, I hope to, to, to just read in the chat here.
Yeah, in uh, later I will show how the 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 the, the thing works and uh, how we can we can get the, like the results and how the the workload works. We, we'll get there. <clears throat> so, a practical intro. So, as I said before, it also has a workload that sets a timer in the future, and when the timer uh, fires, we can start measuring the latencies. That's the same starting point. So, but here we have already a difference because we are doing things in kernel. The two also have the control of the IRQ in the middle in the wake up. So it has a one more matter. Getting back to the example before, there's a thread. It says, okay, wake me up at 2, 2 p.m. And then 2 p.m. wakes up. And then this, in the previous example, we didn't see, but between the, the external event and the thread that starts running, right? there is an IRQ handler that runs in the timer IRQ. So the tracer is already, it has its own uh, timer uh, handler. So it can give us a little bit more information. That is, when the timer passes, it's it, the hardware fired the, the, the timer at 2 p.m. And then internally in the kernel, an IRQ handler will, will process this event that's coming from hardware. And it will say, okay, hmm, it's two hour and 10 microseconds. And then wake up the thread and the thread we start running and say, okay, it's two hours and 40 seconds, like before. But at this point, we already know that mm, it's already split into two metrics, the IRQ latency and the thread latency. And then it starts breaking down, breaking down the problem. So here's one example of the interface as a benchmark tool. <clears throat> so hello, humans. That is Daniel from the past writing, and it's a video. It is on my developing workstation. <clears throat> it has 24 CPUs, I think. And there is a workload in background running the kernel compilation. The, the command I, I, Daniel from the past, wrote is RTLA timer not top. That is this top-like interface for the, for the tool. So here we can see the CPUs and the amount of events that happened, how many times that the per CPU thread was awakened, the workload was awakened. And here it says the current, the current, uh, uh, the current latency from the thread that happened. Okay, I will pause here. This is the minimum IRQ latency observed on that CPU. You see here it's zero, that's very, very short. The average latency for the IRQ handler, which is between zero and one, but there is some, some maximum values that are more than one, right? There's IRQ latencies that are hitting for 17 microseconds, 20 microseconds, right? And then we, we jump to the thread side. So in the thread latency, this is similar to the number that we get on, on cyclic test. That is, how much time did it take for the thread starts running? So here's the current value. The minimum value, and here's an important point. So the minimum value that we are seeing here, it's one microsecond, two microseconds. You see, it's it's almost in, in the limit that we can think so can think on Linux, right? It's one microsecond latency. Take this, get this number as an evidence that the timer lot, even doing the things that I will show you later on tracing, even though it's doing tracing, it's not only running, but running and tracing, the overhead is very low because in the minimum, it's not hitting the like 10 microseconds. So it's still within the one microsecond granularity, the overhead. That, that's a question that people generally ask. It's a granted that question, so the overhead. So the minimum on the thread is very low. So the overhead is within the granularity. So we have an average number and then the maximum number here. This is one interface that gives us an overview of the system. There is another interface that creates us a histogram. <clears throat> so we can see all the execution, not only what is the mean, the average and the maximum. It shows during all the execution, how many how many uh, latencies were within one microsecond, within two microseconds, within three microseconds. 
so we can have more partial uh, <clears throat> partial view of the system. So here is the index. It's in the, in the zero in, in within one microsecond, right? In the zero microsecond range. Here is the IRQ. So in the CPU zero, there was eight hundred and eighty three. IRQs that happened within one microsecond, right? But the thread, there were some that were in the one microsecond, more than two microsecond. And here we can see that, okay, it, this is the, the curve for the thread, it's very short for the IRQ. And then we can see that the thread is a little bit longer and it gets longer the tail, right? So we can start having a more uh, a more integral way of visual visualizing it. And here we have some summaries, like how many wake-ups we, we saw, what is the minimum, what is the average, what is the max? Yeah, I think that's it. So, so um, slideshow. Okay, so oh, Daniel, your uh, microphone turned off. Ah, sorry, the no those worries. interface. I'm too old for the current for a user interface. I like turn off. No, I'm kidding. So yeah, I had to to move the zoom the zoom widget. So that that is the more the simplest form for the the RTLA tooling. That is using all the infrastructure as a benchmark tool. It's transforming the tracer into a a, a benchmark tool. So, uh, but when we are doing those measurements, we are not only or generally we are not only doing the measurements to see how how good my system is but also to see okay i i'm measuring the latency and in my case the maximum latency i accept is 100 microseconds for example and this for this 100 microseconds i would like to know anything that happens that is longer than 100 microseconds i would like to like to understand what happened to see how can i adapt to my system for for me to reach this target latency, right? And to adapt to my system would be like either tuning my system, isolating the CPU, move this thing to here from here to there. Or, okay, this is the part of the code. I need to go into that part of the code and try to break it down a little bit more or try to make a report for the file system developer that doesn't understand much about RT. But if I give him a good starting point that shows that, okay, maybe it's a problem on your subsystem, it will be easier for them to start working because it's hard to make people start working on a thing unless you give an evidence that the problem is there, right? Because maintainers, they're busy. They have tons of problems to solve. We need to make their life easier if they are not real-time maintainers. So, so timer dot can be, uh, can be set to do the measurements and stop the tracing if uh, a threshold is crossed, right? This threshold can be the thread latency and can be the IRQ latency. <clears throat> so because Daniel learned that he needs to make his life easier automating the things, uh, the RTLA has an option that is dash A, which, is, which means dash auto. And this option has a value that is the threshold. This is the magic option that will try to enable the default things that uh, 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 and, and that that myself or, or the community, the people that give me feedback, right? What is the, when I would like to stop the trace and have an analysis, what is the option that we generally enable? Because it's get harder, right? And uh, this option, this option, that option, that option. It just, there is this magic option that will evolve over the time to get the best setup of uh, options of the tracer. So the dash A threshold, it will enable this common set of options for RTLA, run the trace and produce a report if it crosses the threshold. <clears throat> and here it comes the auto analysis. So <clears throat> timer lock stop 
Just, just I will move the widget here. Just you guys are not seeing, but I'm moving one thing from Zoom. Okay. So here it's saying run timer latch stop and stop the trace if the latency is higher than 30 microseconds. It, it's more options, it's going there and enable them. Stop if thread is higher, stop if fire key is higher, stop uh, print the stack trace, but they are condensed here. There, there are more options and talk about it later. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> it started running and then it hit a, a latency higher than 30 microseconds here. Thread latency 35 microseconds. And it printed a report. So here we see that there is uh, this spin lock in the middle. So the RQ latency, the RQ delay, the RQ handler, it delayed for 12 microseconds. The IRQ latency, that the IRQ that looks at watch and see it was 14 microseconds. The IRQ handler took this amount of time and the blocking thread was this amount of time. I will reach to these, these things later. But just giving an example. So it was this AS command that uh, hold an spin lock and spin lock inside C group that is inside the butter FS. And the AS is the assembler for this compilation here. So we hit the latency and we know that this was the command. It was a write to system call inside the butter FS that was doing C group operation that disabled our spin lock. So we have here. Uh, what well, can I say? The fingerprint of the latency that I hit. With just the RTLA dash A, the, the latency. So the rest of my presentation will be explaining those things that I talked before, the the blocking and the interference. Here is just to give an idea, right? It's just to introduce the problem. Do, do you have any questions so far? If not, I'll continue. I can keep speaking. Oh, good. Let's continue. Oops, stop. And then I always need to do this because I don't know how to use this interface well. Uh, slideshow. Uh -huh. So now we we'll get into the auto analysis. That is, uh, what composes that 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 fingerprint that I showed before. So the auto analysis it decomposes that latency into a set of variables, right? And these variables, they can be analyzed independently. And here I will do a comma. So these variables, there is a research work that explain those variables and explain why they, they are independent. It's a research that I did before RTLA that proposes a tool that gives the worst case execution time, the theoretical worst case execution time latency. If you click in the link where where I have this presentation here that was posted before, there's also in the last slide, you see a link for that research. That uses formal methods to show that there is a bound for the schedule latency and, and use the, that, uh, that more heavy academic notion. Uh, that will, will go into the kernel into the future. But meanwhile, I took part of that and integrated into RTLA with something that's more what people are used to see which is like a sampling, not worst case. It's all the samples, not the worst case. But that, that's the topic for another presentation. Still, there is some background that explain why these variables are independent. For those that like go into the, the hard part of, uh, of, of real-time theory. No, it's not real-time theory, it's real-time theory. So each variable can be analyzed independently. And so IRQ, and thread, why, why they're separated, right? Mainly because IRQ and thread latents have different uh, analysis. The calls that delay uh, an IRQ and a thread, they are slightly different. So the importance of having the two separated metrics. And it's important to, to note here that mainly when, when people think on real-time Linux, they are thinking on the parameter G or the fully preemptive kernel, right? Uh, and yes, that, that's the main use case, but all these tools, they are not made only for the parameter T. They work for any kernel. For the kernel with parameter T, without the parameter T, without the parameter T in the full parameter mode, without the parameter T in the voluntary parameter mode. It works for all, it's independent. 
right? And, and that's a good thing. It's not it's not exclusively for the parameter t. Also, because the no parameter t kernel can also give acceptable numbers depending on the latency that you target. So it's it's all generic. It's not only for the RT kernel. So as I said before, the time not to use abstraction from the theory, and there is this there is that resource that backs it up. But just bringing some some abstraction from theory to make it easier for us to communicate. So when I say execution time is the the amount of time for the task I'm having interest to execute. So the wake up of a thread, there is an, uh, an IRQ involved. The execution of that uh, ex the execution of that IRQ is the execution time to make my, my to make progress on my system. So that that's the execution time. It's, it's the the execution time for the thing I'm interested in here, or the time to accomplish the task required for the the scheduling latency. Then there is one there is the execution time that I have interested, but there is also the execution time of things that are blocking my scheduling. And by blocking, we mean anything that has a lower priority than the the task I am analyzing. So things causing delay with lower priority, it's blocking. And there is also interference. Interference are the things that have higher priority than the workload that I am analyzing. And here I open up parentheses that by default, Timerlat uses the 5095 priority. So anything with priority lower than 5095, it's blocking. And things with higher priorities, interference. But we need to break down with more than only threads. Because Linux is not mainly made only for of threads. When we get into this, this lower uh, fine-grained matrix, we can have more tasks abstractions or more complex where things run than threads. So for, for the research, we split the kernel into no maskable interrupts as a sort of task. This has the highest priority because it will preempt our queue, it will preempt software queue and preempt threads. So it's, it's a higher priority because it preempted the others and the other doesn't preempt it, right? Uh, so what level, before, what level after we have IRQs? IRQs, they preempt software queue and threads. Right, they preempt, they, they cause interference on software equipment threads, but they do not cause interference on NMIs. Uh, NMIs can cause interference on IRQ. But if we think on the kernel locking, uh, locking mechanism, we know that one software IQ and one thread, they can block the IRQ execution. So they can cause blocking on an IRQ if they disable IRQs, like we saw in the example before. So. Threads, uh, so IRQ can be blocked by software IRQ and threads if they disable IRQ. Uh, the software IRQs, they are lower priority than IRQ, higher priority than threads, unless when they move into threads, like in the print RT, software IRQ become threads, so become equivalent to threads. And then we have threads that can only print other threads, but they can still disable software IRQ, disable IRQ, and cause blocking for them. So blocking, Interference. So let's get to the case of an IRQ latency example and analyze it and try to start thinking into these variables by reading the auto analysis. So I run RTLA timer lapse stop stop uh, stop the trace if the the latency is higher than fifty microseconds. Let's say, right? It's higher than fifty microseconds. It stop the trace. And here is one example. But to make it easier to understand, I will I've I've created like a, a timeline of uh, of the events that are happening here. So the timer lot thread set a, a timer for the future for the 2 p.m. And when it was 2 p.m., the hardware dispatched the thread, dispatched the, the event, hardware event, and the IRQ latency was 32 microseconds. That is, the IRQ handler started working, and then the, the IRQ read the time. It already passed to 32 microseconds. And here is the report. Because I know when the handler started working because of, by analyzing the trace in the background, right? we can see that the IRQ handler 
it started running 31 microseconds after the expected time. So here we have this IRQ delay of 31 microseconds. So something delayed the starting of the execution of the handler, the IRQ handler. What can cause what can cause delay? There was no interference here. So it was something causing blocking, blocking for the IRQ. What can cause blocking IRQ? Threads. But what was the blocking thread? It was the object tool. It, it was the example of compiling early in background. So object tool, uh, it caused the blocking. This number here is not for the IRQ. This number here is for the thread that we'll see before, see after this. So there was this object tool the blocking thread, and then we can see the stack trace. The stack trace, you get back to it and see, okay, there was this write, write uh, system call inside the butterfs, and then we get into C group, blah, 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 and see raw spin lock IRQ restore. This function, if you go, if you know it, you understand that it was disabling IRQs. If you don't, what this, this function do, is it, it locks a spin lock? It's, it unlocks in the spin lock, but the locking of the spin lock disabled the IRQs. And this function, it's unlocking the spin lock and re-enabling the IRQs. So the thing that was running from the expected time until the handler started working, the thing that was blocking it, it was the, the function that run inside this critical section. So inside this critical section, uh, something delayed for at least 31 microseconds. And why it's user, right? Why do we need the synchronism? Because it's not a root cause. It's the a kernel synchroni synchronization. It's not the problem. It's the mechanism used that caused the problem. So where is the problem? Hmm, th the problem would be in the C group. C group is calling a, a function that disables the RQ for too long. So it's doing something for too long inside there. A and then of if- questions. Daniel, in, uh, uh, one in the chat ahead. and then one in uh, uh, Q&A. I think that might be relevant for the current discussion. Uh, what happened between, okay, this one microsecond here, it is handling the timer. It's hand, starting handling the timer, changing to the handler that handles the, the timer.irq, doing tracing and so on. So it's the execution time of the handler that is. The handler starts, it selects inside of the timer subsystem. It needs to select which timer fired, and then this timer fired. It will have some overhead of the tracing, and then it will print there. This one dot one seventy microsecond. That's the the answer for the question in the chat. What what is the other question? There is a question in Q and A. Um, I can read that out to you. I don't know if you can see Q and A box. Let me see. Okay, Q and A. Ah, okay. On can multi core CPU process multiple IRQs in parallel so they do not block each other? Uh, does this depend on the CPU architecture on the operating system? So let me reread it. Can we multi core CPU? Well, so they do not block each other. So the multi core CPUs, they can do multiple uh, handling in parallel, right? Now, if at the hardware level they will block each other, I don't know. I'm a operating system guy. In in the I'm a one level above. I would just point for the hardware, and we'll talk about this later. But assuming that in, it's possible in the in the hardware, and it's possible for the granularity that we work on the microseconds, that's a lot of time for hardware. So they 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 are in parallel for our level of granularity. So if they do not block, does does this depend on CPU architecture? Yes. It depends on CPU architecture, but that's probably a problem solved for our CPU people. And, and at the operating system, yes, they can happen in parallel in the operating system, and they will not block each other unless you use a synchronization mechanism. Like if you have all your handlers, they run in parallel, but they all will fight for the same uh, lock that is global lock. Then they will lose this. They will not run completely in parallel. But if they don't share any resource, the kernel will just run them in parallel. They, they run in parallel. Even the timer can run in parallel without interfering with each other. But there is also a kernel feature that tries to create a, a tries to, for a scheduling timer at least, 
try to put a shift between one and the other. But yes, they can run in parallel. So I guess it depends on if there is dependencies between those um, IRQs. I hope there is no dependencies on all of those. If they are, then they will be uh, dependencies, yeah. meaning one IRQ, uh, them needing the same resource. Yeah, correct. But in the best case, they can run in parallel. Right. It's not a problem. They are not serialized by default. They are not serialized by default. Good. Uh, let me close this window here because I already have too many windows. So here is one example. So we see that there is one patch in the kernel that added this pin lock that disabled the RQ. In the middle, do, do you guys see the pointer when I'm moving it or no? Like when I'm moving the, the, the pointer, the uh, mouse. We can, we can see it. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a little, but we can see it as you're moving, yeah. Okay, so keep moving. So here in the middle of this code, there's something that requires the RQ to be disabled. So if the amount of, uh, if this latency is not acceptable for your system, you have two options. The first option is don't don't compile things on the CPU where you carry the latency, right? Don't 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 run this 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 task there. Do CPU isolation, for example. Uh, do use uh, task affinity to avoid this piece of code on the CPU where you care about latency. Uh, on another like another top other approach would be okay. I need to run this code there. So I need to go into, into that part of the kernel and breaking it down into smaller pieces or removing the dependency from depending on the IRQ, right? That goes into more advanced topics, right? But if you come with a, a report like this to a person that works with C group, you will get less resistance on, on understanding that, okay, your problem is on C group. You, you give like, okay, that's, that's a good starting point. We can go further with the tooling, but that's at least a good starting point. So there is another example that we also saw here, which is there is one, one abstraction that is release a jitter. The release a jitter is the, it's, it's a, a delay caused by something that is outside of our context. So for example here, I can even take this here. You see here, there's max timer data RQ exited from idle, 19 microseconds. And here we have a better example. <clears throat> so we we set the timer lat to stop at 50 microseconds, right? Stop at 50 microseconds. And then we see, okay, the RQ handler delay, it took 30, 90 microseconds for the handler to start working. Hmm, that's suspicious. If we look what was running there, it says swapper, that is the idle thread. And what was the idle thread doing, right? This part here is the IRQ handler, so it's not the cause, it's my execution time. It was doing idle, right? The CPU was doing idle, and here the timer lot is already giving an evidence, exit from idle. So in this case, the latency was not caused by the operating system postponing the ARQ. It was done, done it was it, it was caused by the exit from idle uh from idle uh, machinery from the car from, from the hardware that tries to save power. That is the system goes to sleep in a, into a, a deeper idle state to save power and it but it causes a drawback of taking time to wake up the processor, not the operating system, the processor until the operating system can start running. And here is a case, right? It was not the software causing the delay, it was the hardware waking up from a deep idle state. And the delay in the and the tool is already pointing here. Okay, hmm, this this is an exit from idle. We go to an idle. There is a lot of analysis that we can keep added into the tool, and that is the idea, right? But from from th this tool, it's, it's pretty young, and uh, it's already giving us uh, composed hints of what is going on. It, it only can get, it can only get better. 
So, and here we go. That that's where really we're talking about the thread, right? The the IRQ latency, sorry. But what what happens next, right? And here was is one example of a thread delay. So, in this example here, I think I don't need a timeline. Yeah, I don't need a timeline. <laughs> Uh, so in this case, the IRQ handler delay, it was zero. It was near zero. So so close to, <clears throat> to zero that it's within the, the error margin for some mic nanoseconds, microseconds. Because actually the IRQ latency, it was like 1.64 microseconds. So we are really running, things are really running fast, right? And here we have the, the timer lat IRQ duration, that is the execution time of the IRQ handler. It was 90 microseconds. Okay, it's not that bad. And then we see like a blocking thread. Hey, the blocking thread. Ah, and then we see that the vast majority of the number is in the blocking thread. But the thread we see down here, the amount of interference, that is, while you're waiting for the thread to schedule after the IRQ handler, while you're waiting for the thread to schedule, the system had some interferences from, from other things with higher priority. There was one timer IRQ, that is another IRQ, not the one that will get up, yet another that took 3.68 microseconds, that's nothing. There was soft IRQ interference. We got like, 4.21 microseconds, the sum, eh, not that relevant. And then we have even a thread that preempted the blocking, my, the, a thread that run before the timer that thread that I was analyzing. And it was the migration thread. That is a thread with the highest priority on the system. It's even higher than the deadline. It runs in this top machine, right? So we have interference from IRQ, software IRQ and threads. But if you see in the percentage here, it's a very small amount. So they're not that relevant. By the way, this is clearly inspired on a receipt. <laughs> and I try to use this as a receipt because it can't get easier than a receipt. <laughs> so, uh, and here we see, okay, main, the main thing that caused delay, it was a blocking thread. It was a, a thread running, right? And this thread was in the was a K worker thread on the CPU forty. It's a, a user uh, a un, unbounded K worker, right? It was a K worker thread. Is this U? It means that it is unbounded to the CPU. It's running here, but it might run on other CPUs as well. This is what this U means. So it was running. It was doing a butterfs uh, work that compress pages. So it was the third work in a coworker from ButterFS compressing pages. And it took 500 microseconds. Why did it took 500 microseconds here, right? Why it's so big? Because this is not the preemptive kernel. This is the no preemptive kernel. So we see higher latencies on the no preemptive kernel. And this also shows that the two worked for the no preemptive kernel as well. So there was a long, a long run between these function ZSTD compress block fast between this function and the next check for need rescat. And this was like 500 microseconds long. So if one would not in the no even in the non real time kernel, right? Non real time kernel, I'm okay with uh, with uh, 100 microseconds latest or 200 microseconds latest, but I'm not not okay with 500. What can I do? I can try to move the affinity of this key worker, the unbounded key worker, to avoid this work to be done on the CPU. Or I can try to get into this code and try to see a point where I can add a, a check in it reset and try to move forward from it. But yes, in the in the thread, when it starts seeing more in the, in the thread side, we'll see generally this. Locking thread higher in the RT kernel because it's disable preemption, or on the non-RT kernel because it's this point is very far from the next need to risk it. Am I going into these more deeper points? Yes, 
Maybe it's harder to understand from now on. Yes, but if we open up Bugzilla with this starting point here, it's very easy, even for a known that super expert kernel, to see in which subsystem they need to start working or who they should contact. Or is this, is this problem similar to that other problem that I saw? Am I still reproducing that known bug? So it's a good starting point. We stop saying, oh, it was 400 microseconds to say, hmm, it was blocking thread and it was a key worker on the butterfly subsystem. It's way more precise than saying it was a that latency, who knows? So, uh, and then we can go deeper here and say, okay, uh, that that report, it's it was good as a starting point, but I need to go further. Daniel, there is one uh, question probably on a previous slide. U40 is in worker pool 40, not running on CPU 40. I think there is a question in the- uh, Oh yeah, no, no, it, it could be, it could be the 40 can be, that is the number 40. The 40 might, might not be the CPU 40, might be just the, the ID for the, the thread, yeah, yeah. But the most important part is the U here. So it's not uh, bounded to the CPUs, it can move. And so it also makes sense it not being the CPU number, yeah. It's a, it, it can be just the idea of the keyword. Anyways, the thread, it shows here with CPU if you trace. So RTLA timer dot trace. So we can, we can go deeper into tracing. Right. So because RTLA is a time RTLA timer not is a front end for the tracer, we can see tracing events from it. So uh the trace activates uh in the, the tracer by default it activates these OS noise trace points. They are the minimum trace points for us to compose the autoanalysis. They try to do some processing in kernel to avoid overhead because the overhead of right to the buffer would be higher than processing. There, there is research about it and we can talk later. But so we have one trace point for each of the causes of blocking and the uh, and, uh, interference, interference blocking execution time. And also important that these values, they are read free from nested interference. That is the thread noise if in, inside the thread, I have a software queue, an RQ, and an MI, the value of the thread noise, it already discounted the amount of time that was caused by the software queue, the RQ, and an MI. So you don't need to try to, to remove noise from the value of duration or the execution time. It's already dealing with this in kernel. So you can just read it straight. So here's an example of auto-analysis editing tracing. So it's timer lot on editing like the dash a 30, stop if the trace, it's if the latency is higher than 30 microseconds. And it's just running on CPU4 here to make it easier to read the, the trace. So it starts running and then it blocks, it shows the auto analysis. And it says here, saving the trace to timer.trace.txt. Probably Daniel from the past will read this file. Uh, okay, it's showing here this clear page, year MS. It has this function there. You can see that the the IRQ latency was one microsecond. The time out IRQ duration was seven, 17 microseconds. And here's the trace. This is pure uh, F trace output. And then you can see like the 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 timer lot events in the kernel. And we can see this OS noise trace point saying, okay, the thread noise, which you, this thread noise here that translates into blocking into the autoanalysis, it was the CC uh, command, this was the PID. It started at this point and it took 9.2 uh, microseconds. And these are the things that the RTLA is using to, to compose the autoanalysis. The autoanalysis is so based on this amount of events. So it tries to minimize the amount of events. So by minimizing the amount of events, we minimize the overhead. And these events are processing part in kernel to minimize the overhead. So it's trying to get the minimum overhead as possible. Do we have overhead? Yes, but the overhead is within like the margin. It's within the granularity that we are analyzing the system. 
So it's okay. Okay, is this tool available only on Red Hat or other versions as well? It's all that I do is full open. It's available for all distros. Uh, the, on Fedora, we have the package already. I know that in Debian, there is a package. And on Ubuntu, I know that the tracers are, are enabled, but we don't have the, the package yet. Andrea Rigi, Andrea Rigi in Italian. Andrea is enabling this on, on Ubuntu. And if it's not enabled right after the next release, it will be right a little bit after as a UPDA. He's working on this now, Andrea. So it will be available on, on Ubuntu and it works for all distros. It, RTLA is, is part of the kernel. It's a tool inside the tools director, directory in the kernel. So it's generic kernel stuff. So, okay, trace out analysis, getting back to the slides. So, uh, okay, but then, the auto analysis is based only on the very, okay, there's a Q&A here. Sorry, I didn't see it. <clears throat> Does RTLA depend on a particular kconfig? The only kconfig that it depends are in the kconfigs that enable the tracer. So you depend on the trace, you depend on enabling the OS noise and timer lot uh, tracers. That's it, basically. So they don't depend, for example, on being printed or not or being SMP or not. They only depend on, on themselves, the things to, to make the tracer available. And as I said before, yes, it is, um, it, it works for the you know, real time kernel as well. So it doesn't depend on that cable thing. Good question. Yeah. Type answer, okay, answer live, I guess. Done. Um, okay. <clears throat> So the RTLA timer lock can also be used as a front end for other tracing events, because why not, right? So it's possible to enable any other trace point in the kernel, appending it to the timer lock trace output. And not only the events, it's also possible to filter the events and using tracing trigger features and it's possible to do some cool stuff, you can see. Still, there is a lot of things to develop, right? The, the tool is, is it's, it's not even enabled as a package on, on Ubuntu, so it's very new. So here we have, <clears throat> okay, I dispatched the timer lot again, same command line, but it's also enabling some kernel events. So enabling this CAD events, the work EQ events, and they are Q vector events and they are Q events. These are classes of trace points. So here it's enabling all these classes of trace points, and then it hits the stop tracing, and we look at the trace output. Go ahead, Daniel from the past that that made these videos. Come on, Daniel from past. Oh yeah, Daniel from past is hitting, showing that this free on reg. As you can see, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not that good at making videos. But it's saying the timer lot IRQ duration was 30 microseconds. There was an IRQ work, IRQ. And here we can see that we have more events than before. So for example, if you see the mouse, we see here is CAD waking and SCAD wake up events, IRQ work events together with timer lot events. See timer lot IRQ, but also the wake up events for the timer lot thread, the local the execution time of the the IRQ handler, but also the events that say okay it was a local timer, this is the vector, and so on. So we can have a, all these events enabled, helping us to to go in deeper into the analysis. Let me move here. So, uh, but going more than enabling, and this isn't this where we start getting more <clears throat> deeper. It's also possible to, to leverage the OS noise trace points that shows like the, the blocking and interference 
to collect statistics or histograms for all the sources of uh, for all the sources of blocking and interference from the curve. There is a page here. It's linked to the also in the page. It, it's on my blog. You see on the page where we have the tutorial for this presentation. There is also a link for this page probably. So here is here is an where I copy and pasted the command line, and you see here in this video because it's it's a very cool command line. So here I'm going there, I'm copying, and here this is the monstrosity of a command line. Let me see if I can. Okay, it's below the so the RTLA timer lot. It's a top timer lot. It's enabling the OS noise event. Uh, it's a little bit, let me see if, ah, this bar is in the middle. You see, I'm not a YouTuber, but I, I hopefully it will be able to see. So um, RTLA timer laptop, it's enabling the OS noise IR NMI event, and it's saying, I would like to have a trigger when this NMI trace point happens. And this trigger is to create a histogram uh, or a histogram of the duration of these events for me to collect a histogram of how long the NMI is happening. How, how long does these NMIs are taking to run? Same thing for the IRQ. IRQ noise create a histogram of the duration of each IRQ. Same for software queue, same for threads. <clears throat> so this is the command line that it runs. So timer lot will start running. It's doing now the measurements. You still hear there is a little bit of overhead. So from the minimum from two, we start seeing three. You see, it's within those acceptable values. It's 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 very low overhead. It's from it was from from two to three, right? But you see the amount of information it gives us. It's it's worth the overhead. That's it. So here it's running. It's doing the measurements at the same time. It's creating histograms of the execution times of the things that create blocking and interference and execution time of the area. So, and here at the end of the execution, it saves those histograms into files. So let's see here. Uh, there were NMIs on the system and on the CPU zero, <clears throat> there were, there, there was, there were two NMIs that took nine microseconds. Again, this is, Pure tracing output. Yes, there is a to-do to making this looking pretty. I just didn't have time, right? There is a to-do on my to-do list on making these uh, these histograms easier to see. But it's also, it's already possible to take this. So, so on the CPU weight, we have, uh, on the CPU weight, on the six microsecond uh, range, we have one NMI. The higher number you see here, okay, on the CPU 22, there was one NMI that took 10 microseconds. So take, take a note, 10 microseconds on 10 microseconds. The NMIs can create an, uh, an interference of up to 10 microseconds. So, ah, it restarted. Okay, let's get back to here. NMIs. So now IRQs. Hmm. So the IRQs we can see <clears throat> it starts by CPU. So before all the CPU zero, not CPU one or CPU two, and then sorted by the duration. I think at the end we'll have a higher one. So going back here. So here in the CPU 22, where I'm pointing the mouse, the mouse, there was a timer IRQ <clears throat> that took it, it only owns, but it took 32 microseconds. Right? <clears throat> so I have a timer IRQ that can reach up to 32 microseconds, and I have an NMI that can take up to 32 microseconds. So my minimal latency is easy to say that my minimal latency is 42 microseconds because if the 32 microseconds happen and it as it is independent from the NMI, I can have a bad case where I hit both together, one after the other, an RQ and NMI, and then my minimal latency is 42 microseconds. 
even though I might not see in the timer lat output because they didn't actually happen while sampling. But if we get them synchronized at the same time, I can say, hmm, it's possible, <clears throat> it's possible. And when we start going into this level of number, we are starting to compose the worst case latency. And that's the other work that I mentioned at the beginning that tries to compose what could be the worst case latency if the worst things happened out in the worst possible order. And here it is about, uh, let me not just, okay, this is the blocking thread. So <clears throat> how much, how much, how much uh, blocking lower priority threads are added into my system? And here it is, you see it's 14 microseconds. I think there was one. Yeah, I will try to block the screen here. Uh, okay, let's say 10 microseconds here. There, it, it seems that there were more, but let's say plus 10. So the 42 microseconds, they now became 52 microseconds. Because if I am unlucky to have this RCU thread running and then while my my IRQ was was about what was set to fire. If this thread was running in, in this case, and then we have the NMI that is independent from it happening, and we have also an IRQ happening, we can sum these three two, two things that are independent, say, okay, my latency could be up to 52 microseconds. <clears throat> and so we started doing this, this game, right? Even though here, see, it was 52, but here in my example, uh, yeah, there was no, no, simple, no single sample that took 52. Still, there are, there are evidences that it could be more than, than this number here. The max number here was 42, I think. 45. Yeah, it was 45, but it can be up to 52 if we compose those metrics. And this kind of analysis, they can only get better with the as the two evolves. That that's the main goal. But to reach there, we need to, to experiment things. So uh ah, the as I showed in the first example, there is in kernel workload and user space workload. I started by doing in kernel workload because it was easier, like to show as a proof of concept. And then I extended the tracer to, to also enable user space threading. And it's also possible there is the dash U option where it's a user space thread instead of a kernel space thread. <clears throat> so with the user space thread, we have one more field. <clears throat> Also, I, I, as the Daniel from Pest is running here, it's the user space thread. Here it's an RTLA thread, but it can be any tool. It can be like your, it can be ROS2. Right? You can measure the latest of ROS2 if we adapt it, for example. It can be like at something inside the middleware that uses the timer lot interface to go to sleep. When it wakes up, timer lot can produce a, a scheduling latency. Uh, report for it. Uh, I have an example with ROS2. Or it can be like a Python script. So here is IRQ timer latency that we know, the thread latency. And here is the user space tool after it's finishing processing. Right? So <clears throat> I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I put a diagram for it, but we have this metric here that is the overhead of going to the user space and returning to the kernel. It can be both in the top and the histogram. I recently submitted a, a patch to the kernel, it's in 6.9, where you can use a Python program as the workload. And then you can extend from that Python program to a, any program. And how to use TimerLot to monitor your program using the TimerLot interface. So you can point to the root cause for the latest for any program not only for timer dot. It, it got in, in the 6.9. By the way, uh, we are, we're heading to the end. So by the way, there is a lot of options on timer dot. 
you can set the period for the thread. You can limit the CPUs that it's running. For how long do you want the experiment to run? If you would like to see um, the bugging of, okay, it's going there, it's enabling the tracer, it's setting priorities and so on. Uh, the the tool, it starts as a, it starts as a 5095 thread priority, but you can set any priority. You can set like it for it to be a SCAD order, that is the non-real-time scheduler uh, with, a, with a nice, it is changed now. It, now it's nice. It was a priority before. You can say, you can say it's a round robin. You can say it's a it's a FIFO changing the FIFO priority, or you can say it's a SCAD deadline task. For it to be a SCAD deadline task, you need to disable the real time throttling to to allow uh, tasks to be pinned to to cores. You can say <clears throat> for timer lot to run. Like the, the thing that collects data for it not to cause disturbance to the workload, you can limit it to run on set of housekeeping CPUs. Let's say you you run timer lot on CPU zero and then monitor CPU one to the max CPU. You can set uh, timer lot threads to a different C group. And uh, you can do some sort of tuning for the exit from idle to avoid the exit from idle problems. And so, on. by the way, and then we get from by the way too, that is before running here, the, the trace analysis, it was done assuming that your hardware runs without interfering with the thread. <clears throat> but it can be the case that the hardware itself causes, uh, <clears throat> causes stalls on the execution of the CPU. So the hardware, as running, it blocks, like for example, to run a, an, an SMI, and it blocks the entire operating system. So the hardware can cause scheduling latencies as well. Or in a virtual machine, if we're running a vCPU, and then the vCPU is printed by a thread in the host. How those things can create scheduling latency? And here's this tool, the hardware noise, it measures the the, the schedule latency, just a second. It's allergy season in Italy already, it's spring. Uh, so this hardware noise tool, it's a tool part of RTLA that is based on the OS noise tool. <clears throat> and then you, there is a paper that I point in the beginning of the slides that explains about this OS noise tool and hardware noise. So I'm saying measure the noise of the hardware on CPU zero to seven. <clears throat> and this dispatches a per CPU thread that disables IRQ and try to see if the hardware is, is, is uh, stopping the thread execution. I'm not going into the tiles, but it's able to say that, okay, in the CPU zero, uh, in the CPU zero, after this amount of runtime in microseconds, there were 33 microseconds that were that were stolen from the operating system by something that is not microed thread. So <clears throat> here we can see there there was one one stop of from the hardware that took eight microseconds. So the hardware is there were ten times during this time that the hardware stopped running the current thread and did something else I don't know because I'm not harder guy. And they and they create these latencies here. If we get this eight here, if we get this 10 here, 10 microseconds that the hardware can add it to my latency. And if I sum up with that 52 that we summed up before, we can say that my latency can be up to 62 microseconds. And then we can start composing. But as a rule of thumb, <clears throat> not, are you guys seeing the screen or not? This is not seen screen all dark. Hello, humans? Um, I can see the screen. Okay. Yeah, maybe it was a little bit before, but now it's working. Yeah, it's it's, so, it's fine, and then I can even see the cursor. So it's good. It's all good. So as a good advice is before 
going into, into scheduling analysis with Timerlot, be sure that your hardware is tuned to not have latencies. Or be aware that if your hardware has latencies, any number lower than this max single here, at least, they might be not in the operating system, but the hardware creating noise into the scheduling latency, right? These hardware noise, they make things very random and it complicates the analysis. So it's easy to be aware of this number before, try to get it as lower as possible doing like BIOS tuning or CPU tuning, like disabling idle states, uh, setting up stable frequencies, disabling hyper threads. Try to get this number lower because this number here it influences on the granularity that you are able to trace the system. It's th this, these kind of bugs are tricky. And yeah, final remark. <clears throat> so the, the timer that it integrates the workload, the tracing and the auto analysis into a single tool. So it produces a summary of, of, uh, of the root cause for a latency spike. And that's a good, good starting point for the analysis, even for a non-expert. Like you don't need to be like a tracing expert to know, okay, it was that, right? Maybe I can just set affinity and we're good to go. So it, it, this is user, user experience, uh, not a kernel level experience of the budget. And, and this helps out those people that are coming to enable Linux on new platforms that they don't want to be a kernel developer. They are developing the cool stuff that run in user space that, that humans can understand. And humans generally cannot understand kernel, and that's sad. So they are developing tools that my mother could see and say, good, Daniel, I'm proud of, I'm proud of you. And not she doesn't understand kernel, so she's proud anyway. But yeah, those people doing the new stuff in the user space, enabling the cyber physical system with Linux, they don't need to understand the kernel to be able to make their products. They just want to do a report that that will make things easier for them. So having this level of information, it helps enabling those people and help enable this use case for them. And it will also allows the usage of more advanced tracing for those tracing nerds. Uh, the RTLA is home for other tools for analysis. <clears throat> like the timer lot, there's the hardware noise, the timer lot that we saw, there's also the operating system noise tool. But it can only get better, right? Uh, there is, it's possible already to measure the execution time of tasks running timer lot or running or measuring the device noise trace points, but I need to do a better interface for those things inside RTLA to make it easier to, to run, to, to understand. <clears throat> All this work it was motivated for by it was motivated by a research that shows the formal proof for the scheduling latency. This is the RTSL. I think I thought about I talked about it at Plumbers at 2020. Uh, the goal is to make that part of RTLA. I just don't did it, it yet because the time lot is more, let's say, what people are used to work with psychic tests. And, and many people are not interested on the worst execution latency, but on the average case and so on. I have been working with Paulo Bonzini on integrating these things with KVM. So for example, the hardware latency, instead of pointing to the KVM, to the hardware, like when you have KVM in the middle, now it's always pointing to the hardware. We will be able to differentiate from the noise added by the KVM and by the hardware. And whatever the community needs, this thing can only get better. So uh, this presentation, before doing it, I did a tutorial and then I built the presentation. So you can see a verbose version of this presentation in the link. It also has a recording of an old version of the presentation there. And there is like the text explaining all these things here. It's, it's uh, even I even I consult it, and yeah, that that's it. We have any more question? No questions in the chat at the moment. I think you already answered this question, Daniel. Is this tool available only on Red Hat or other versions as well? 
I'm, I assume that is RTLA. So I put in a link for the RTLA yeah. uh, in the kernel and then also the documentation. Yeah. Yeah, it's available for 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 Linux in general. I mean, you can just compile the tool and run it. Um, yes, yes. And it's compiling very and it's compiling very nicely because I had oh, to yeah. rework all the make files. I just compiled as we are talking. It just has a couple <laughs> of dependencies, happens to not have on this system, this set test system. So yeah. Good. And 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 that was the thing that I fixed, like because Linus ping at us saying, "Come on, the way that you guys do dependence check is not good. We write out the make files <laughs> now." I oh, I see. That. Yeah, yeah. It just told me what to install. Um, live trace event and live trace fs, and um, just installed both, and then done. So. Good, good. Now it's that that was work I did last month was all trying to make the make files better. Right. Linus say lovely, so yeah, yeah, we'll print that mail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you have to, you have to print and po uh, frame it, uh, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> he says lovely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Stephen, I'll say print it and frame it. I will do. Uh, <laughs> Stephen said the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I'll print it. I'll, I'll make a t-shirt like with it printed. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, the do you use the latency tool in the in the same directory tracing? There is a latency collector. Uh, do you yeah. use that, or you, is it something uh, you don't have a need for? That that's more of a simple code mm -hmm. because the tracing subsystem it can notify if there is a like RTLA timer dot. And the printer Q disable tracers, they have a notify interface oh. that if you enable those things and wait for the notify events, those notify events will wake up the thread. That latency collector is a simple code for that interface, but it's more of a simple code. Simple code, okay. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you all. It's pizza oh. time in Italy. Looks like. Uh... There is one question. Can it be used to identify noisy neighbors? Oh, can you identify noisy neighbors? Okay. Yes, there is one option that helps you identify that. There is on timer dot. There is an option that is dash dash dump tasks or dump task that when the trace stops, it will print all the threads that were running on the other CPUs. So for example, it is based on a real case. So we were seeing high IRQ latencies. But these IRQ latencies, they didn't make sense because my CPU was idle. And uh, and it looked like it was a, a, a hardware-induced uh, uh, latency. Right? It was something running on the system that was causing the hardware to do like chunks of stalls. And I was seeing on my CPU that the hardware was stuck in, but nothing was running on my CPU. And it was like in between the thread handler and the thread, uh, the, the, the starting of the handler and the print from timer lot. So that number is very short. It's generally in the one microsecond range. It, and it was getting up to 10 microseconds or 50 microseconds. So it didn't make sense. It could only be the hardware. So what was happening was that uh, on another CPU, there was a, CP, uh, a video driver that was writing to the video card. And this operation in the hardware, moving the memory, was stuck in all the CPUs. So what? What we were seeing on the tracing was on some CPU, there was a key worker running for the video driver. It was always there, always that CPU running a video driver, a key worker for that driver. So what I did to automate that was when the, the dash dash dump task, it does this. When you hit a, la a latency that is higher than the threshold, it will bring to the auto analysis but also print what was running on the other CPUs. And if we start to see always the same guys on the other CPUs, we can start looking for, okay, what is the other code running here? 
So this is one example of noise neighbors. That that dump dash dash dump task help help it on that. So in this case, uh, was the K thread or uh, process was it tied to that CPU? No, so it was running on another CPU. Okay, but... not necessarily just. Um, uh, scheduled to run on you know, users can specify just tie it to that CPU. So yeah, CPU. no, no, it was not tied it to that random. CPU. Random. Yeah, it was random and it was not where I observed the latest, it was another CPU. Mm, okay, and then and then, but on that case, we we ping it to the hardware person and say, We are seeing this, but we are always seeing your driver there on the other CPU. If we disable your driver, it stops showing the problem. Hey, thank you, Joe Mario. I know Joe Mario. It's just a a, 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 a a compliment in the chat. I like Joe Mario. Thank you, Daniel. This is a, this is a great presentation. Uh, uh, okay. I think that people can take make it take advantage of this for sure. You know, um, people have a lot of questions on how do we configure, how do we track, how do just like noisy neighbors questions. So this will yeah. Be, thank well, you for the, doing this. These, these are very advanced questions. Thank you all. Ciao, ciao, Belly. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel and Shura, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.